Good evening and welcome to this uh, webinar in association with Tickmill, uh, myself, Charlie Burton, um, and I'm going to be talking to you over this next hour or so, or maybe a little bit less, um, about how I made 573% swing trading FX um, on a trading challenge that I've been doing over the last um, few years. If you don't know me, um, I'm Charlie Burton. I'm... Um, I've been trading 27 years now. Um, I'm a professional money manager as well as I manage my own money, um, but I'm also regulated here under the FCA uh, to uh, to manage funds. And so I manage a few different um, uh, funds here in the UK. Um, and like I said, I've been trading for quite a long time. Uh, I don't day trade anymore. I used to have uh, won five back-to-back -back five years undefeated at the London Forex show. Uh, and uh, live trade off at the London Forex show. So I've done quite a lot of stuff like that. Uh, I've even been on the BBC. Some of you will, you like the TikToks, yeah. Um, I've been on the BBC in a documentary called Traders Millions by the Minute. Uh, that was a few years ago. And I've been interviewed for the likes of the Financial Times and all the usual broadsheets and the likes over the years. I think that's probably enough on me. Um, so I've been doing this for a while. Now, this challenge, in fact, before I go any further, um, I'll just read off the disclaimer in association with Tickmill Hill, because uh, this webinar is um, put on uh, by Tickmill, and I would highly recommend them to you. If you don't currently have an account with them, I would uh, recommend that you do. They're a very good broker. They've got great spreads, great execution, great range of products and services. So I'd highly recommend um, using Tickmill as a preferred broker. But by all means, as I, all, I would always say, yeah, uh, if you don't currently have an account with them, do, do your own research, but they are very good. I've um, had very good experience of dealing with Tickmill over this last couple of years that I've been um, uh, dealing with Tickmill myself. Okay, so the risk disclaimer is the material provided is for information purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. The views, information and opinions expressed in the text belong solely to the author, that's me, and not to the author's employer, organization, committee or other group or individual in the company. I am not, uh, I'm not, they're not my employer, but this is a standard uh, statement there. Uh, high risk warning, see if these are complex instruments and come with a high risk of losing money rapidly due to leverage. 75% uh, and 74% of retail investor co accounts lose money when trading CFDs with Tickmill UK. Um, you should consider whether you understand your how CFDs work and whether you can afford to take high risk, uh, the high risk of losing your money. Okay, so we have to go through the risk di disclaimers there before going through anything more in the webinar. So do check out Tickmill if you don't currently use them. Um, they are well worthwhile um, doing that with. Right. So the story then, the story of this trading challenge is that I started the trading challenge. I've just got a chart up of the euro dollar here because a lot of my trading during this challenge has been on the euro dollar. The, the challenge started in June Oh, oops, that's way too thick, isn't it? So let's change that. Okay. June of 2020. Okay. So that's when this challenge started. I like doing these trading challenges. I've been doing them on and off for the last decade now. Um, I, my very first trading challenge I did was a 10K to 100K challenge. That took me two and a half years to do that. This current challenge was slightly different. Um, so what I wanted to do was start with... A slightly larger account. Now, I appreciate that people are based all around the world and trading with all sorts of size uh, of capital, but um, just a little bit bigger. The 10K, that was $10,000, so around about £8,000. Um, so the $10,000 to $100,000 challenge was one. Um, this challenge, I thought, well, I'd start it a little bit higher, um, at 20000 and really with the goal to try and turn it into 70,000, which would then clear a, um, 
a 50,000 profit. That was the idea. That was the, the original goal for this challenge. So I'm going to go through the statements in a bit, um, but I'm just going to go through how I've approached this challenge first and foremost, the uh, the overall methods that I've been employing, the, the markets, as I've already just alluded to a little bit here, the markets and why those markets, uh, all the reasons and rationale for um, the, the trading activity and the style of trading that I'm using as well. So that's what I'm going to go through first, and then I'll then we'll go through the um, the statements itself. But this was the, the the challenge that I set myself, just to see if I could turn twenty thousand. No time limit on it on this one. No time limit. Just twenty thousand. See if I can turn it into fifty thousand to clear a fifty thousand profit, which um it, and you know two hundred odd percent um two hundred and fifty percent return. Could I do that? Okay. And the thing is, when you do these challenges, I, I do them in real time. I'm, I'm still involved. I'm still doing this challenge to this day, you'll be pleased to know. So, um, and it will continue. Um, so that was the where the original challenge. I know once I've got it up to the account, up to 70,000, I thought, well, you know, I might as well carry on doing this challenge. And let's just see how it goes. And so um, I'm still doing this challenge to this date. Um, I last did this update that I'm going to be showing you here this evening in December. So just a couple of months ago, um, it was when I last updated to uh, the wider audience out there. So I'll next be doing um, an update for 2024 uh, in December of this year. So what I'm showing you this evening is what I actually um, showed in December. So um, right away up till December's uh, when I did a webinar in December. So, but I'm doing this specifically for um, for Tickmill here. Okay, I think I've answered the questions of where did the challenge come from. So that was the reasons and the rationale for doing a challenge, just to show traders what can be achieved. All right. Now, like I've said in the past, I've you know I've done a lot of day trading in years gone by, but that's not really what I do now. Um, as you get older, sometimes you think, well, actually, I don't want to be in front of the screen with the same level of intensity as I used to. So this challenge is, and the returns are all from swing trading, okay? They're, they're all from swing trading. So that's holding positions from anything from a few days. So let's just say from three days through to anything up to really three months, is the time frames that I'm generally, and any and everything in the middle is what I'm trading over. So that's the sort of time frames I'm trading over. So the current return, as you know, uh, as of December of last year, was about was five hundred and seventy odd percent. Um, I'll show you the statements uh, in a bit. And so, how have I generated that five hundred and seventy percent over those? What's that over three years? There, um, three and a half years. Is that three and a half years? So in my book, it's a decent return. It's a solid return. And so I'm going to show you, you know, what I've done there. But first, before I go through the chart, I'm actually going to bring up a Word document before I go onto the chart. And I'm just going to list out just a few of the main concepts, the core concepts that I use in order to, to trade and approach the market. So the first one is multiple time frame analysis okay so that's the first thing that i use is top-down approach multiple time frame um, analysis is the one of the first things that i do before i take any trade it was always the same when i used to day trade years ago i'd want to look at the higher time frames first and then drill down to the time frames that i might be executing off so it's exactly the same sort of principle but when i'm swing trading i will go out to um weeklies monthlies and quarterly time frames so i'll go right away out to the quarterly chart well, usually i start at the quarterly and i work my way down so top down multiple time frame analysis another big one uh, is sentiment analysis now there's not and so what i'm looking for when i'm looking at sentiment is extremes in sentiment now, it, sentiment can be measured in, in many, many ways. And I'm going to give you some examples during tonight's uh, webinar of, of where I was trading 
and using sentiment. So sentiment is another important part of my trading, but it's not there all of the time. There's not always extremes in sentiment just you know um, all of the time so uh, but at t at certain times um then there are and it can be really useful so i'll show you um some of those uh, examples as well so sentiment analysis is really important but on a day-to-day -day basis we can use sentiment we can look at what retail traders are doing we can look at what uh the large speculators and hedge funds are doing as well in the futures market so we can get a gauge um uh, of short-term sentiment but also we can um, look at big picture sentiment, what's going on in, in you know, uh, the big major publications like the likes of your Economist magazine, Reuters, Bloomberg, all of that stuff, all of those reported articles that do come out from those news sources are really useful as well. So I'll go through some of that here uh, tonight as well. Of course, uh, there's the, the macro um so the macro environment is important. What news releases are coming out, especially with trading Forex, um, highly sensitive to um, economic data releases um, from um, the likes of the US, Europe and, and the likes. So that's something which is used as well um, within, within all of that. I can um, uh, use sometimes um, short-term sentiment actually along with macro. So that's important. Um, one of the biggest things that I use is this. Adding to winning trades. This webinar is being recorded. Yes, it is, Aiden. Yes. Uh, adding to winning trades. So that's one of the big factors of my overall profitability is adding to winning trades i'll tell you a, a brief story i was talking to, with a a boutique broker um well over 15 years ago maybe 20 years ago maybe not quite i think it was probably about 18 or 19 years ago and at the time i was considering um using them they were a boutique broker look uh, who dealt with uh, really small hedge funds and or and money managers so anything up to sort of 20 million really that was being managed so they wanted me to um manage some of the money that i was trading um with them and uh anyway i was having this conversation with the the owner of this small brokerage at the time um one day and i said well, you know what are your what's your Who's the most you know successful traders you've ever come across? Or I didn't want to know individually, but you know what is what are their traits? What are the traits of the best, most successful traders that you've seen in your experience over the years? Because he'd been around for a long time, and he said the best traders, he said that I've ever seen are those who, when they get into a trade, they will milk it for all it's worth, for all they can. So they will try and hold on to the trade for as long as they can and they will add into it as it goes in their favor now at that time that wasn't something that i was doing and i didn't immediately you know leave that conversation and think oh i must do this it was actually several years later that i actually started to do it myself so it's funny how these things uh, happen but I still nevertheless remember that conversation. And so coming back to my point here about adding to winning trades, a large part of my profitability is the fact that I will add to the, the winning trades as they move along so that they can exponentially grow. Um, if the trend continues, then I will make uh, way more than just taking a and a standard trade and then just running it to a target because I will be adding to that position my positions along the way I will go through adding to positions this evening I'll come back to it but um but yeah we will go through that and then lastly of course um uh, let's call it entry yeah now Hopefully, you may have noticed something here. <laughs> um, so I've just put, and then we've got the strategies that I use or slash entry techniques that I use. 
Now, one thing you may have noticed is that these have come last on my list. What I find in my years now of decades of experience is most traders spend an inordinate amount of time try, you know, trying to perfect or find the holy grail of strategies, entry techniques. As you've seen, this is actually comes, what, fifth on my list. So, and isn't it funny? We all know that statistically, something like 80% of all traders will fail, yeah? Um, and yet, what is it that probably 80% of those traders are doing chasing the holy grail of trading strategies? Okay, so for me, of course, I still have to have entry techniques and, and strategies to, to get me into the market, but that comes after all of this stuff that I'm really uh, looking at, the multiple time frame analysis, sentiment, macro at least anyway. Uh, adding to the winners obviously comes after I'm, I'm into a trade. But what I'm trying to say here is that doesn't come first. Most people are looking at this stuff first. Uh, and that comes further down the list for me. Okay, so these are the main concepts that I'm using within my trading. Okay, so all I'll now do is come over to the charts and I'm going to talk through this um, this period um, before I go to the, well, have a look at the um, the statements itself. Um, but I'm going to talk through this this whole period of trading since I started in June, this challenge in June. So it would have been around about here of somewhere around about here of 2020. That's when I started this challenge. So just a bit after the, the complete, the, the world went crazy with, with COVID, of course, and just a, cu a couple of months or so before that. And so it was right in the middle of, um, you know, many of us being locked down or whatever. So let's talk through this. Okay. Most of my trading, but the majority of my trading is not all of it, but the majority of my trading is undertaken on the euro dollar currency pair. It's the largest currency pair in the world and most liquid, of course, for that reason. Um, essentially, what you're doing if you're trading the euro dollar is you're essentially trading the dollar index. Um, the euro makes up you know, nigh on 60%, close to 60% of the basket of currencies that are traded against the dollar index. If I inverted a euro dollar chart, then it would look like uh, a normal, the dollar index itself. Um, very often the euro dollar um, just looks like an inverted um, dollar index. So uh, essentially what I'm doing is I'm trading the dollar index essentially. Don't get me wrong, I will trade other major currency pairs. I will trade the S&P, the NASDAQ. I will trade other markets. But 90% plus of my trading is the euro dollar. So I've got this on a weekly time frame here, just so not really for, so that I can squeeze all this data in, in a in a nice enough format onto this chart. So all I've got on this chart is just a 50 uh, period moving average, my black line here. And in the lower window, I have an MACD. So I do like the MACD indicator. I use the MACD indicator for things like divergences. Okay, in the main, that's what I will use a, uh, the MACD indicator for. So starting in this period of um, coming into 2020, what was quite interesting, actually, I do need to squeeze this back a little bit because what hopefully you can see through 2019 going into all that volatility as as covid all kicked off um was it overall looking at my macd lines down here there was a, a huge divergence huge divergence on this weekly time frame so that was the first thing that um i'd been tracking over that prior period coming into 2020 then we broke up here uh in uh, this was in the spring, so about April, May. Uh, I was here, so it's a little bit earlier because I'm I'm on a weekly time frame. So it was um, we had a break up here. The challenge didn't start until the June, but I'd personally already been trading the up the the long side prior to that. But the challenge account didn't start until the June. 
So I wanted to be on the long side of the euro dollar, um, following those huge uh, divergences as I've shown there. Uh, that was so I was looking for more upside here. So I started you know, in the challenge buying the euro dollar. Um, now, one thing I must um, emphasize is that, yeah, okay, no problem, Mohammed. Is that my my win rate? My actual win rate is relatively low. Okay, so it, it tends to be. It depends on the 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 time of year and what's been happening. But it, I would always put it between you know thirty and forty <clears> percent. <throat> so I'm not. Uh, you know, and yet still making over that time frame five hundred and seventy percent. So I'm not interested in high win rates. I'm just interested in ultra high risk reward ratio trades. That's what I'm. That's all I'm looking for. That's what um, I'm putting it all together. All that data, all that analysis together for, is to get me the ultra high. Um, uh, risk reward ratio trades what, what I, where i get to add into it as well and those are what deliver the returns i'm not trying to be right all of the time i could do it by just banking my profits a lot sooner but i wouldn't be as profitable so i'm looking for the most profitable way of approaching the market for me and uh using the style i have if i bank the profits too regularly too soon i wouldn't be as profitable i wouldn't generate uh that return so as a result, the longer you, as you know, the longer you hold on to a trade for, the, the lower the win rate because the the more likelihood is that it will roll back over. Okay, the longer you hold, it'll only be the few that just keep going and going and going and going. Okay. Oops. So coming into 2020 here, um, I wanted to be on the long side, so I was. Uh, uh, buying but of course uh, i'm not always right as i've just said so i'm still gonna have you know quite tight stop losses at times because i'm using multiple time frames i will still take trades off of four hourly charts even hourly time frames but i'm always using those to then get me in on a trade that might hopefully develop into a swing trade so i like I've just said, with the win rate, you know, there's plenty of trades that I will get stopped out of. In fact, when I started the challenge, I went straight into a drawdown immediately. The 20,000 dropped immediately to sort of uh, 19,000 and something like that. So, but that's just Murphy's Law. That sort of thing's always going to happen. <laughs> you start a challenge, right, okay, let's see how we get on. Oh, no, went almost immediately into drawdown. But then it came up, and so uh, as the the euro went up, and I managed to get more more positions um, in the direction of of travel here, so I rode the euro dollar going into right away into the December of that year. I was lucky that year. I, it was one of those years where I, I could didn't put many foot, feet wrong. You know, you know where I got in, roughly speaking, was all right. I was still having some stop outs, but I managed to capture. That move there, uh, this consolidation here, I used to, um, so I banked profits in the July here, used this pullback consolidation to ac start accumulating more positions um, uh, in and to take me into the end of the year. So I had a target at 123, um, which was right up um, here. That was based on the multiple time frame analysis. What was interesting, what was fascinating as we came into the end of uh, that year was that from a sentiment perspective, uh, you know, the, the, the big news, financial news outlets were all calling for more dollar weakness. So that, And so when you get the likes of Reuters and Bloomberg and elsewhere, and you're seeing articles talking about, oh, that's it, you know, it's the demise of the dollar. And that was what we were seeing article, headline articles. I haven't got any um, saved. Or I didn't save any at that time, but I've got others to show you. Um, but um, there was a lot of articles coming out in the into the sort of November, December of 2020 talking about the demise of the dollar for 2021. 
Now, when you start seeing lots of headline articles like that, you have to look the other way. You've got to then start to think, ah, maybe we're at the end of this trend. <laughs> so yeah, there was other reasons there for me to, from a sentiment perspective, to want to get out and not only get out, but actually also to short. Now, what was interesting up here, so yes, I started shorting into that first quarter of 2021, right away down to my 50 period moving average. Down here was my, my target. So again, I couldn't put a foot wrong for a while. Um, we had this divergence here. You can see these these lower peaks. See my blue lines here, which is the MACD line it's worth itself. Um, between that peak there, so we'll call that one, and this is number two over here. There's one, and there's two there. So not only do we, the euro had got up into that technical zone that I was looking for anyway, around the 123, I think it went to 123.50. Um, we had all of that uber bullish sentiment, which raises a warning flag when everyone's saying the same thing you've got to think oh maybe we're nearing the end of this trend um, plus we had divergence here on the weekly time frame so i shorted into that first quarter of um 2021 so you're thinking right okay charlie's on a roll here and i was i had a really good 2020 and a really good start to 2021 but i'm always very open and honest about you know where i make the, my money and where i lose money as well because that's the realities of trading. If people tell you they make money all the time, you, know, you have to sort of uh, take it a little bit of a pinch of salt because everybody loses money as well as making it. So that's where I got to into there. Then down at this point, this was, you know, I use moving averages quite a lot in my trading. So when the euro dollar came down to this 50-week uh, moving average, funny enough, on the daily chart, there was a divergence going the other way off the back of my mind uh, off the back of my head and so i bought i started buying down here might have been on the four hour chart actually um so you're thinking well now so i was buying here doing my usual adding to the winner as it started coming up then i started adding to the winner uh here like i add to my shorts as they were coming down and the previous longs as they were going up so i'm doing the same thing and i had a target up here um just that little bit higher. Um, I think it was at about 120. 23 again was my first target. Then I had another target beyond that. And it got to really close to 123. Didn't quite get there. And then it just rolled over. And so, and the thing with one of the downsides to adding to winning trades, because they're whatever style of trading you had, there's going to be, you know, uh, the good elements of your style and there's going to be the the drawbacks of your style whatever your style is okay so if i'm adding as it's coming up I, I, i'm i'm having to trail my stop up in order to justify the the add-ins um and then of course um, that brings up my average price as i'm adding in so that's all fine all the time it carries on trending up. But if it pulls back and does a deep pullback, I'm going to get stopped out. And so that's what happened. So I'd been in a trade for a good couple of months there um, and I need to get nothing from it. Okay, fair enough. So made no money there. In fact, you know, gave you know, whatever the open profits were, they all came back. Uh, what, oh, Stuart, what are the nine other indicators not shown? Oh, he's talking about over here. They're moving averages, Stuart. I've just taken them all off just to clean, keep the chart nice and clean for you. So it's just moving averages. Yeah. So um, I use a multiple of moving averages. Right. So then the euro started to roll over. I was looking for it to come up that little bit more. It never quite did it, like I said. Then it started to roll over. So I let it roll over. Um and really, I didn't start meaningfully shorting it until the September of 2021. But then between September of 2021 and the lows of 2022, um, I had about, in total, uh, seven major, uh, I say major, but yeah, major profitable trades. Now, what did I, um, I say earlier on? You know, I'm only looking for I'm looking for those 
those bigger winners where you know I get in, have a have a really nice run, build the position a bit, add to the winners, and then hit targets, trade done. So. In that entire period from the September of 2021 down to you know, about a year later, I had about seven major profitable trades. Everything else was losing trades, you know, getting nicked out of trades. Some trades would be just sm very small wins where you trailed your stop and then you just get trading stopped out. So, but I'm just I'm underlying it was only about seven major trades. The point I'm trying to make is you don't need to have lots and lots and lots of winning trades. If you get into trades and uh, you don't just bank your profits too soon, you get those ultra high risk reward ratios, then you can do very, very well. Thanks very much. So for me, the where did I make the bulk of my profits? Yes, it was in the September time when we first broke down through here and I had a run there. Uh, then we had a consolidation through for about two months or so here where I just lost money. And then in, um, when I say lost money, of course, there's risk management going on. You know, I, I you stop losses and, uh, and risk a certain amount um, per trade. But I wasn't making any money through that period is what I'm saying. So then we had this drop here. So I would have, um, I, I caught uh, most of the down drafts, the majority of the down drafts I caught through 2022. Um, there was one that I missed because I was on holiday and that was uh, this down draft here. So I missed that one. And then I caught that one there and then that one there. So well, that's saying six, but I, I think it was probably about seven trades overall through that. So just going with the trends um, and using uh, breakdowns in price. So my overall analysis my top down analysis was looking for more downside and then i was using in conjunction with the top down analysis of the higher time frames the quarterly charts and monthly time frames then um, looking right away down to the daily charts and four hour charts for entering positions and that's all i was doing is looking for breakdowns um in uh, on the lights of the four hour charts and daily charts once price would consolidate and then start rolling over then that would give me my next entries and i can go through the specifics of some of the entry techniques that i use in a bit but that's what i was using through there i'm just doing this top uh, this high level approach first of all before we go um any further just talking about where you know what i did and where i've made the money on the account uh over this period then we got down to um this was a fascinating uh, period as the euro dollar got down to these lows in the uh, late September, early October of um, Aiden. No, no, I this is not a monthly chart, this is a weekly chart. So, no, <laughs> I use multiple time frame analysis, Aiden. You, you maybe you come to it uh, late, or maybe you came to the presentation late, but I've already, uh, yeah, I use the top down multiple time frame analysis. So um, I don't use a singular time frame. Most of the trades I'm actually executing off the lower time frames, dailies, four hourly charts, even down to the hourlies at times as well. Um, so what was interesting down here is we just had, you know, a 15 month uh, fall in the euro dollar. And as the euro came down, the euro dollar contract got down to parity, first of all. So it got down to one, then came all the way down to like 95 or so. Now, that 95 level was quite a, an interesting level because if I go back to the early 2000s, the euro launched in 2002 and the the high, um, it's not showing it on this chart, but of when it launched, um, I think it was 2002 yeah, uh, at the time, matched in nicely with this low here. So, in fact, why don't I just take you to... The monthly chart and make it a bit easier on myself there we go right now you'll you'll see see it maybe it was 2000 sorry yeah there we go so we got that high there coming in with this low here okay so but not just that also going way back before that on the composite chart um 
there was uh, this uh, low here as well, which came in the same level, okay, about 95 or so, 95, 96. Now, of course, oh, 1989, sorry, that was. Now, of course, that was, that's a composite price. The euro didn't exist back then, but it was a, um, but that 95, 96 zone was a really important level there. So if I take us back to the weekly charts, and as we came down into that zone, what was fascinating, if I bring up from a sentiment perspective, what were the articles looking like at that time? Well, on Bloomberg Business Week, we had this article saying, can't stop, won't stop. The Fed has turned the US dollar into a wrecking ball and there's no end in sight to the carnage. If I zoom in a little bit more, you'll see that that article was dated the 3rd of October, the 3rd of October uh, of 2022. Well, um, the euro had already bottomed on the 28th of September. There you go. Sometimes the timing of these articles is uncanny. Um, so the euro had bottomed on the 28th and we were seeing a lot of articles like that. And so again, from a sentiment perspective, really, uh, fascinating. So, um, so I started trying to get long because I knew we had this massively negative sentiment. Now we had big reversals. Uh, we had a key reversal. If I go to the daily chart and if I can zoom us back or scroll us back here, uh, there we go. Um, Sorry for all the movement here. Big key reversal bar on on that 28th of September itself. Um, and the euro, although it chopped around for a bit, um, ultimately it never went lower. And so we had that combination of multiple tiered support uh, down at that, uh, that price zone down there. Massively bearish sentiment. And then big reversals like this... Um, this key reversal bar there as well. I'm just going to take us back to the weekly chart, chart now. There we go. So then road, um, the, the upside taking, you know, realistically, only realistically, it was the bulk of the gains were from the about November um, through into, I can't remember, into the December actually. It, well, I rode um, to other trades into the early part of, 2023 now what was it fascinating coming into 2023 then was the euro dollar um started to chop a bit so it did this pullback here uh i wrote uh, then got long um i was trying to get long through here so had a, a nice run through uh into the april time i think it was and then it rolled over of course i've been adding to my positions like i always do if it hasn't quite got to my targets which it didn't um, it rolled over. I got stopped out. Make no money through that period. Got long again through here. Did hit some targets up around the 112 mark. So, yeah, okay, banked some profit. But again, been adding to the position. Um, and as it rolled over, just got stopped out on the rest. Okay, so then um, what had actually happened was that we we diverged again. So that same divergence pattern that I showed earlier was going on between this point here and this point here. So as it once it starts rolling over, um, we I know we've got the divergence pattern in place, plus what was going on from a sentiment perspective at that point. Well, yet again, we now have uh, sentiment in the other way. Strong dollar remains the only game in town. 5th of October, uh, 2023. Oh, sorry, that's not there. That's not at that point. That's down at this low. Take that back. So we had that divergence. I ended up um, shorting off of that and having a you know a, a couple of months of downside. Um, again, adding to the trade, um, and then and then uh, taking the profits down in this zone down here. Um, and like I've just said, and it was fascinating because we had this three three month pullback, only to then have see this sort of sentiment as i was just showing right into the 5th of october of last year strong dollar remains the only game in town where did the euro bottom somewhere around there i think it was um i can't remember the actual date if i go to the daily chart but where was the the low the 3rd of october there we go so again 
I'm looking when I start seeing those sorts of articles and we had divergences again down in down in this zone, um, I'm going to start looking the other way again. So then I got long um, in that right around that October lows area because um, we had technical reasons to be buying um, divergences into t technical um, levels. And, um, and then we had all that sentiment there as well. Why things been interesting now, funny enough, then the euros had this great run into December and then just pulled back into, uh, uh, into 2024, just over this past, what, six, six weeks or so. So, um, again, my trade, I've built the trade up and then it's just, um, just rolled over. Okay. See la vie. So, um, but like I've shown, um, I don't need lots and lots and lots of winning trades. Don't need that. Um, doesn't matter. Um, the, I only need a few and that's all I need. Most of the time through this three, three years or so, um, the, um, the win rate, as I said, overall will be, you know, is in that 30% to 40% range. But I will be more profitable looking for my style here, looking for those trades, adding to the positions and putting up with the times when they just roll over. I've got, I've been doing this for 27 years now. I have a thick skin towards losing trades. I know and I appreciate many traders don't. You don't have to, and uh, you certainly don't have to trade this way. Um, but what I'm here to show you is just to give you some um thoughts um about holding on to trades more if more traders held on to their trades just a bit more they would be more profitable yes they might have to sacrifice win rate but they would be more profitable i'm a i'm a an, i'm an extreme really because of the way that i um will want to hold my trades for you know significant periods when they when they work they they make me you know significant profits I have to put up with all those other ones that just roll over and stop me out. So you may say, do you know what? I don't want to trade the way that you do, Charlie, and, and, and hold on for as long as you do, but I'll, I'll add in a bit. So let's go to adding in to uh, winning trades. So before I come to the statements here, now, the if a very very simple way of approaching adding into winners is whatever your technique is so if you've got an entry at this at this point here here's your entry and your stop loss because of course you should all be using stop losses um unless you're trading unleveraged it's a bit different um and your stop loss is down here so price starts moving up in your direction for you so it's only once you're in a position to move the stop loss up on your first entry. So this is entry one here. It's only once you can move the stop up on your first entry that you can, you're then in a position to say, right, okay, um, I'll now use a consolidation, pullback, whatever, to add a second entry, entry two but only once the stop on the original entry has been moved up. So this is a nice uh, beginner way of looking at adding to uh, your winners. So you don't have to have loads of, of add-ins, but if you've got a target, let's say is up here. So let's say this is your target. Your target price is up here. Rather than just having your entry here and then just sitting on the trade until it gets to the target, at least entertain the uh, the thought of ah, well, once it's got maybe halfway to my target and my stops are entry at uh, break even at entry now, I can, if I want to, look at adding another entry. So rather than maybe having a rather than say um, a three R trade, which is a lovely trade as it is. Instead of it being a three R trade, it could end up being a, you know, let's say a five R trade or maybe a six. So, and you only need to put one add in in. 
and um what and that's just a, a beginner way of of looking at it so only once you're stopped on your original entry is moved up can you then say right i'll i'll use another entry technique if i get one to get me into another position and i'll add another position here now the problem that a lot of traders have is that they don't want to once <laughs> psychologically once they've moved their stop to break even they don't want to now put more risk or risk back into the trade because they've they it's like a relief that they their stops at break even now and they don't want to take a new new trade i get that but that's the road less traveled that's where the more profitable trades come from is being able to to actually say oh i know my stops at break even but actually i'm gonna have to now put another entry on and obviously this one will have an exposed you know a stop loss on it um, itself but if you can get your head around the psychological point of okay stops are break even but now i'm just going to put another position on then overall you may well find this is um uh, makes you more profitable overall it'll bring your win rate down why because there'll be times whereby let's use this as an example let's say at this point you've got your second entry in okay um if you if you hadn't have put if you okay and let's say it rolls over so you're now going to end up with a break even entry of your first and a minus 1 r on your on this second entry if you had have just had stuck with your original entry then you wouldn't have had a minus 1 you'd have just had a break even trade yeah and people are like yeah yeah I would I, I just have the break even trade yeah I'm only interested in an overall profitability. I don't care about win rate. So I will put up with those ones that roll over, knowing full well that in the bigger picture, I'm going to be more profitable having a few of those that, that roll over and end up not even having a break, a break even trade. It'll actually be a loss. I'll take those losses because I know that those, those trades that do go all the way um, will pay for the losses and and be more profitable. So that's my attitude towards those. So there you go. Just some food for thought for people who have not looked or considered adding into winning trades. I do not advocate adding into losing trades. That is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about adding into trades as they go in your favor, not adding into trades as they go against you. That's um, something else entirely. <laughs> okay. So at this point, oh, just bear with me. No, no, I'm still okay here, right? Okay. So at this point, okay, let's bring up the uh, the account so we can have a look at the equity. Now, I started this uh, trading challenge uh, three and a half years ago. I didn't have a relationship with uh, Tickmill at that point. So this challenge account is actually with a different broker, just so you're aware, okay? Um, it's actually with a different broker. So... Sorry, I'm just uh, clicking stuff around here. So let me bring uh, that up. Where's that gone? That's not it. That's the Zoom meeting. All right. Okay. Just getting it all ready to drag it all across here. So um, just for the purposes of this exercise, uh, the broker is Saxo Bank, um, and I've just put my these are my this is the screenshot of uh, the of the report that I'm about to show you. I've just had to take off my dress off there. You know? So this is me. My first name actually is Kevin, but everybody calls me Charlie. That's what I like being called, and that's what everyone calls me. And um, but um, uh, my I was christened as, uh, as that. So. Let's go over to the account summary. So, five, it was, I don't know why. I thought it was 573%. It wasn't. It was 571% over that time frame. So, let's go and have a look at the chart here of this. So, this is the just showing you the equity curve of the account from June of 2020 through to the end of December of last year. And you'll see that, yeah, plenty of drawdowns. Plenty of drawdowns, really nice, you know, winning phases here and here, but, you know, some drawdowns here, 
um, some spikes there, whenever it was nice runs up and then, then pull back and then, then carry on to new equity highs. So that's when, when you get these spikes up in the equity is when I've been in a, a lovely profitable position and then the, then the market just reverses again. So you'll see it a little bit clearer here is another uh, chart equity here which shows you, as I said, when I started the challenge in the June of 2020, it immediately went into drawdown there. So, um, but then from then onwards, so this is just where I am above zero or below zero. So it never went back below zero and ultimately ended up with that return there. Um, and so, yeah, so, I mean, this is, a, this is what I call, this is aggressive. This isn't, um, I don't trade with this amount of aggression on my uh, my main account. So, uh, Kamal, good point, Kamal, uh, has asked, uh, what risk per trade are you using? Um, on this, now, I have to emphasize this is a trading challenge. It's a speculative trading challenge. So, I will risk up to 2% of the account balance on a trade, okay? So, I don't a lot of the time, but I allow myself to do it if i want to so up to two percent a lot of the trades actually start off at half a percent or one percent risk um then i might then add to them so i might still then add to them but then i'm trading the stops up as well but um but yes i i can do two percent at risk per trade i wouldn't trade at two percent risk per trade on my main account i trade substantially lower than that i think that as you get older or if you're trading on larger capital, you don't want the volatility of, uh, of, you know, in your returns. So I don't want the vol the higher volatility potential that comes with, uh, trading, uh, you know, one, two percent risk per trade. Um, so on my main accounts, so this is a speculative, uh, challenge. So that's really the uh, the main stats there. The rest is just uh, going through and just showing the costs and the overnight fees and stuff like that. So that's in the main the uh, the performance there on the challenge um, and where I've got to to date. So what the the continued goal of this challenge is, I will continue it. I'm going to carry on with this. So the account had got to by the end of the last year, I think about 128 thousand pounds. So it started on 20,000. And as of when I did, as I said, when I did the, the update webinar, um, it was on 128,000. And that's taken three and a half years to get to that. I'm going to carry on trading this, like I've said at the beginning of tonight's uh, webinar. So I'll carry on trading this until, uh, well, I don't know, until I get bored, I guess, or... Um, but we'll just see how it goes. And, uh, and that's what I said at the beginning when I started it on 20,000. We'll see how it goes. Can I get it to 70,000? Once I got it to 70, I thought, well, I might as well carry on. Um, and then we'll just see from there onwards. And that's exactly where I'm at at the moment. So every year at the end of the year in December, I do an update on it. I'll do an update December for Tick Mill um, as well. Uh, I do it on my YouTube channel. But, um, but I will do that then as well. Okay. Um, yes, I'm just having a quick look at the questions here. Uh, do negative overnight charges swaps account for any part of your long-term trades? Yes, uh, yes, of course. For instance, would you normally stick to positive swap trades? Right, good question from Paul there. Um, the short answer is no. I don't only trade uh, positive swap trades. It's lovely when they come along. So during 2022, uh, 21 and 22, when I was shorting the euro overall, um, then, of course, I was receiving the swaps there. Um, but you can have some lovely trades trade setups where you're paying swaps i'm not gonna i i don't begrudge paying uh, uh swap fees they're pretty small relative to 
the profits that you're gonna that you generate paul so i don't worry about them too much of course would i get into a long and try and hold on to a long for a year in the euro dollar probably not because the swaps are going to build but um up to three months it's okay it's all right yeah they're gonna they are still gonna build to an extent but um i'm comfortable with that so now bearing in mind paul i'm trading euro dollar would i do something like that and go against the uh the swaps on something like the dollar yen probably not because if you were shorting the dollar against the yen because of the the interest rate differential being that much bigger then your swaps are going to be that much wider so of course it does depend on the currency pair that you're trading i'm trading euro dollar the um the interest rate dif differential isn't too bad and so um yeah i just put up with paying the swaps i'm not too fast hopefully that answers your question there good yep uh ricardo sorry coming back to ricardo said the problem is the survival rate of the positions added this is in talking about adding into positions yes uh it's a valid point um when you're adding into positions then as price rolls back over your the the most recent positions you may have added into added may well get uh stopped out absolutely but that's what i was saying with adding into trades um you know you have to put up with the stop outs as well um right uh jose is talking about can you go deeper into multi-time frame analysis yes um okay i will i'm i can see your questions coming through and i will answer your questions if people have got questions by all means uh yeah now's a good time to be asking so if i come out to a quarterly chart first of all what i'm i'm just doing the basics here jose of technical analysis so what i'll do is if you if i put my trend lines on now which i've had off all night you'll see that uh, this is going way back here on the euro dollar you can see that i've got this major channel major trend channel here i've got also on this a major trend line from the highs of 2008 coming through the highs of uh, 2021 um, there so that dotted trend line plus i've got some more localized uh, uh small time frame uh, uh trend lines at the moment and some horizontal levels on the chart as well one at 114 one down um at 110 as well so what I'll do is I'll take a, a high time frame first of all, quarterly chart, and then just look for you no know, horizontal support, resistance, and trend trend lines or or channels if they are there. So then, what I'll do is I'll then take a read on all of that. Okay, now and I'll look at things like divergences as well. So the euro, for example, on the quarterly chart has been diverging since two thousand since it made its lows here in. 2017 um it made that low down to the low of sorry the divergence only emerged uh, in 2022 uh, down the low of uh late september of 2022 we got this divergence down here as well so um guess what have i been doing since late 2022 in the main been mostly on the long side of the euro dollar we had we hit that major major level as i talked about earlier on we're diverging down here. We had all that negative sentiment down there. And um, so in the main, ends why since late 2022, I've been um, generally taking more long side trades than short side trades. And so I'll start off with that that template there. That, that gives me my overall template. Then I'll come down to the monthly chart and see if there's anything. Because um, when you zoom in, you sometimes see a little bit more on the monthly chart. So... Again, I'm looking for where price may gravitate towards. This sloping trend line, I think, is a really interesting level. This long-term sloping trend trend line that, that started, commenced back in 2008. Simple stuff, but I'll get a read of where price is relative to trend lines, support resistance, and key moving averages as well. So key moving averages like the 50 period moving average, 200 period moving average are used in the analysis as well. And so hopefully I'm just giving you a bit of a, uh, 
a taster on just what I'm doing. So I'm starting out on the higher time frames, then working my way down, all the way down to the weeklies and the daily. So let me give you an example at the moment. Here's a lovely pattern. I love this pattern on the weekly charts at the moment. So if I zoom in a little bit here, 110, okay. This, this level here, price came up in to the beginning or early 2023, hit 110, reacted. No one was surprised there. Big psychological round number level, 110. Um, in fact, I was probably shorting there or a bit after. I, I definitely banked profits on my longs uh, that I was in at that time. Anyway, then it comes back up to 110 again and it attacks it. Bear in mind, this is a weekly chart. So on the daily charts, lots of chop around that 110. Backs off. Comes up to it again. Backs off. Then breaks through. Which ultimately becomes, that's last July. That became a what? A, effectively a false breakout. We then had this three-month pullback. Took out the last lows in the, in the prior uh, sequence moving up. Back down here. Then did what? Came back up to 110. Did a pullback. Back up to 110 again. Got through it a little bit. Little mini false break. And then pulled back again. Well, the way that I'm looking at this chart, this is just the way that I'll interpret this, is that we've had multiple tests of 110. We've taken out these last rising higher, higher lows here. A successful retake uh, uh, or, or taking out of those high lows only to then come back up again. Then we've pulled back again at the moment, but it's relatively uh, small at the moment. So if we get back up to 110 again, I'll be highly bullish for a breakout of 110. I see this is all just building towards ultimately, if price comes back up to it, a breakout. So there you go answering uh that question there you know what do i do and then it's just a case of then just coming down i won't be waiting for a breakout on the weekly time frame this is all part of the analysis then i'll be using you know whatever i'll be using at the time um if the euro was to go up to you know 110 um then i'll be using entry techniques at that time uh to get me in uh, around that area so still got a bit of work to do up there. Um, but um, but yeah, um, absolutely. It's, um, but you can start to get an idea of, oh, okay, he's using that big time frame analysis. He's saying divergence on the quarterly chart. So he's still looking for more upside. Then we got the patterns there on the weekly chart. All around this, you know, false breaks of uh, and multiple tests of 110. Ah, oh, okay. So this is how he's putting it all together. Every chart's different. But I'm just, these are all the techniques that I use. And so I use a lot, you know, a lot of analysis, te analysis techniques to get me in. Okay, hopefully I've answered a little bit of um, that question there from Jose. Um, uh, Thanan, uh, sorry, Thanyani uh, has asked, uh, are you strictly technical, fundamental, or both? No, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, I'm using the fundamentals as well. So as an example, where I might use the fundamentals is if I take this now down to a daily chart, a classic example of using the fundamentals is um, okay. a classic example is... This day here, okay, that's what I was looking for. This day here, so this was back in early October of last year. Um, it was a volatile day. That was non-farm payrolls day. Non-farm payrolls came out really high on that day. You can go back and look and see what the numbers were. The non-farm payroll headline number came out really high. It came out like 300,000 jobs created or something like that. So the, the, the euro dollar should have gone down on the day, and it did intraday. By the end of the day, though, it came all the way back up. So that's a classic example of when I'll take something from a macro perspective, like i.e. just on this occasion, just a piece of news. And if the market doesn't want to go where you, one might think it should go based on that news, you've got to read the price action. So that's um, something that I'll use as well. 
Uh, but overall, do I use the fundamentals? Um, yes and no. So right now, I know, like most of you know, that if you look at Europe versus the USA, which is the stronger economy? Uh, well, the USA. Okay. Where would that, how would you have got on with that if that, you know, oh, since October of last year, uh, if you'd have been you know, selling the euro dollar back down here because the, you know, the euro is, you know, um, you know the eurozone is, is underperforming the US. Well, it wouldn't really have worked for you because um, the euro has actually been appreciating or certainly into December. Then we've had this pullback um, since then, admittedly, but we're not at new lows or anything like that. So I think it's important to be very familiar with the fundamentals, especially the news, the news releases that are coming out on a weekly basis, really important at interpreting how the market price action is moving in in relation to that news but i have to take with a pinch of salt uh the overall fundamentals for example when um if I'm, i've now zoomed out to that october of 2022 do you think the fundamentals at that time supported being long the euro dollar no they did not so sentiment was pessimistic you know the fundamentals favored the dollar against the euro um but there are always going to be times when there's going to be not just reversals but big reversals i'm not looking for reversal all the time uh, you know that whole period i was you know taking lots of shorts and riding this trend um but there are times when price gets into key levels like i went through earlier um where you have to um take notice of it so fundamentals yes but not all of the time uh, is my point okay uh do you look at technical levels as targets like previous highs and lows uh or certain price levels uh come out um well yes to all of that in the main i am uh, my the targets i'm i'm using are usually prior highs or prior lows yes uh, but they may well be, like I just hinted, uh, just uh, went through when I was doing the top-down analysis bit, it may be a trend line or something like that as well. So I will use uh, trend lines or channels as targets at times or a key moving average as well. So I use a variety of, of levels. What I'm then looking for is overlaps, overlaps between, you know, technical pro uh, price, prior price level, which may be overlapping with, uh, um, a historical trend line or or horizontal support resistance as well or even a moving average so then i'm looking to overlap yes um, the initial equity on it uh, was twenty thousand. um yes on the challenge there up to how many pairs do you tend to trade at once uh one aiden <laughs> actually um that's that's a slight fib um i will trade up to four up to four pairs but the reason i said one is because the majority of the time i'm not i'm in one trade at a time uh one market should i say at a time sometimes you know uh, there are times during 2023 where i'd be in you know, two different pairs uh, and i think there was a point where i was in three different markets but maximum usually of four for me um, but most of the time, I'm just in the euro by itself. Sometimes I might be in the euro, plus I might be trading the S&P at the same time. And sometimes I might trade and trade and be in an Antipodean as well, like the Aussie dollar or the New Zealand dollar. So I do do it, but it's I'm not in a lot at any one time. Most of the time, I'm in one, maybe two. But more often than not, 80% plus of the time, I'm only in one pair. And then looking to add to it and build to it. Uh, uh, well, I've got another question here. Where do you start and use outlets index movement? I always find this start daunting. Uh, I'm trying to think what the other question was there. Oh, okay. Um, where do you start? Start with the charts. I always start with the charts. Uh, Fanyani. Um, so I always start with a top-down uh, approach to give myself 
a chart that I actually even like. You know, I like the euro dollar. I've been analyzing this thing for years and years and years. So much like most of the major currencies, I look at them all. It's really important to do intermarket analysis as well. It's not just looking at the euro. I do want to see where the Aussies, what the Aussies doing, what the, the pound dollars doing, what the, uh, the Kiwi dollars doing, dollar yen, you know, I'm put, trying to put it all together. But yeah, the top-down approach, technical approach first, and then you'll just start to get better at the sentiment side of things. I look at cot reports, I look at what retail traders are doing, um, and I do scour around for you know when they're we're getting to extremes, as I've shown some articles there tonight. But usually, there's not going to be extremes in sentiment when there's not been what a trend. So if there's been a, a bit of a trend for over you know, several months, that's when you start having a look. So right now, there won't be any extremes in the euro dollar at the moment, or, or as far as sentiment is concerned at the moment, because it's not really do, been doing that much in relative terms. So um, you'll get better at that. You'll get better at that. That's what I do. Uh do I have YouTube videos teaching my analysis? Uh, I do have a YouTube channel, yes. Uh, most of the YouTube channel uh, access uh, uh, videos are mindset related. Um, but by all means, check them out, yeah. Uh, what are your exit strategies? Ah, oh, William, I think I've already sort of covered that off. I'm looking at prior highs, prior lows, trend lines, all of that sort of stuff. is is, is basic stuff. I'm just looking for overlaps with them. So like I went through when I just put all my trend lines on, if I come back out, if the euro breaks through that 110, this is onto a monthly chart. Maybe I take this back to, uh, bear with me a second. If I take this back to a weekly chart, there we go. So if the euro breaks through the 110 and then I'm, you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm in long positions, what am I going to be targeting? I already know what I'm going to be targeting is this, overlap here between this long-term trend line this declining dotted trend line which i've already shown you goes back to those highs of 2008 and this 114 zone because this 114 zone is a nice historical level there against these highs but it, it goes way back look high of 20 uh early 2020 the covid high then we had all of this price action for it back here and i can keep going back all the way Back in 2015, 16. So that, that 114. Now, if I bring us back again, you can now see, oh, right, significant level. Overlaying with a declining trend line, right. Well, that's going to be a target zone. Yeah. Uh, uh, what do I think about prop trading accounts? Um, I think you mean the funded account type stuff. I'm not really a fan. Uh, most of them, they're great businesses for them. Have a normal broker and make your money the traditional way. You know, they're great. They're brilliant marketeers. Um, but um, in the main, you're, you're, the amount of people that I've come across who have said, yeah, do you know what? I did it. I spent a load of money on challenges. I, you know, I, even when I passed, then I found that they were moving this, you know, widening the spreads on me uh, after a period. Once I, I was making a bit of money, even the people that do make money, which is very few, um, you know, all of these sorts of shenanigans were going on. So, um, so in the main, I'd say, no, have a brokerage account, trade your own money. Do you use FIPS? Yes, I do. David Suarez. Uh, yeah, at times I will put fibs on. I'm not using fibs every day or every week, but when I've got, when I see identify a really nice uh, run in a market, I will put fibs on to see where the retracement levels may come in as well. As far as Fibonacci is concerned, yes. Uh, do you have any live trading days? It would be quite boring, Ollie, because I don't intraday trade anymore. But um, uh... <laughs> but. Um... But I'm always in the market. I'm very rarely in the 365 days of the year. I'm very rarely flat. I spend most of the year in positions. So, yes, I'm always either at looking to add to positions that I'm already in or initiate a new 
entries. So yes, I am in, I am, I'm still, I'm pretty active. Yeah. Where do I think the best information for, for learning? Uh, check me out. Just Aiden, just Google me and you'll, you, you, you can, you can get in touch and just Google me. Yeah. Uh, how would I advise a beginner scalper? Uh, don't do it, Lebo, is, would be my advice there. Simple. <laughs> um, the reason I say that is because uh, for sh very short-term trading like that, if you're a beginner trader, um, then you haven't built the, the, uh, the emotional resilience to the markets. You're going to be way too um, emotional towards it. You'll just end up losing money doesn't matter what your strategy is even if you find something you think is good the market will get you anyway emotionally so you're not ready for it so i wouldn't recommend it um there you go that's a real direct advice isn't it uh use emas in your trading you use uh smas what's the difference and why uh jolita yeah uh, exponential moving averages uh weight the more recent uh data so if you had a for example a um a 50 day moving average and it was an EMA then it's exponentially weighted to I don't know to what let's say the uh the last 10 periods within that 50 period moving average is a bit more of a higher weighting to the more recent periods so what that means is the moving averages will will move more aggressively along with price um a simple moving average doesn't do that. It's simple. That's the difference between the two. Um, there are reasons why I use a simple moving average over and above a um, uh, an exponential. Uh, one such reason is, I'll tell you, um, sometimes um, you get a situation whereby price has done a pullback. So price is maybe it's in a move, in a, an oval trend and it and it does a bit of a pullback and it slices through something like uh i use a 20 period moving average you could use a 21 i know a lot of people use a fib number use a fib uh use a 21 and but it's coming to a nice support zone down here oops um it's coming to a really nice support level here and i often say the moving averages leave clues the 20 if it's still facing upwards it's a clue that yeah there's a good a high likelihood that price will 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 bounce back up to the moving to the moving average itself so it gives me a really nice heads up at times oh we've come down into support and the 20 is still facing up i'll use it with the 50 as well but it doesn't happen as much with the 50 um but it does happen um so i want to use an sma if i had a 20 exponential moving average it would have just moved over and i never would have seen that pattern so for me i prefer smas raw account or standard account for trading uh yeah iqbal um if you are intraday trading then probably a raw account you would give you an edge it's a raw account isn't worth it i don't think if you are um swing trading so if you are sort of scalping in you know, a very short and short term intraday trading, then probably a raw account. Otherwise, just a standard account would be, I would say, yeah, no need to pay the extra cost. Uh, th oh, Thana, Thaniani, um, I, yeah, I did answer your question. Uh, you'll have to get hold of the, the recording. Yeah. Uh, just get in touch with Tickmill, um, or Tickmill will be getting in touch with you anyway. And so, but otherwise, if you don't want to wait, get in touch with them and ask them for tonight's recording. Uh, please explain the major key level support and resistance zone. So I've already done that, so I might come back to it. I've, I've already uh, supply and demand zone you're talking about there, but yeah, support and resistance. Um, uh, I'll come back to that because I've already just gone through a bit, an element of that on this chart anyway. Uh, Cecilia, hello Charlie. Do you use VWAP and Wood and Wood and Anchor VWAP? No, I don't. Um, 
that may be um, more appropriate for very short-term trading, Cecilia. But as I'm swing trading, then no, I'm, I don't. But um, maybe you can still use it for the for my trading. But there's only so much you can use. And so if I put too many overlays on, there'd be times when VMAP, VWAP might be useful to me. And there'll be other times when it's no use whatsoever. So you have to... Uh, I've looked at most methods in trading over my 27 years and had to decide what I like, what I don't like. Trading's a very personal thing. So um, I could add, and I do use a lot of techniques. Um, I I'm, I'm kept things fairly high level here this evening. But um, something like VWAP um, or, or many other techniques are absolutely fine. But what they would probably do for me um is sometimes they might be useful then other times they might keep me out of a trade that actually ends up being a brilliant trade so i'd rather not bother so uh, hopefully that answers your question but nothing wrong with it it's just personal you know as a trader you can't use everything you have to just use what you like yeah um, mm. loads of questions coming through still here at the moment i'm happy to keep going um what do you think about grid trading and trade analysis? I mean, the direction of the trend with dollar stop loss and dollar take profit. I don't know anything about that, Ali, so I can't really help you there. Um, that never heard of it. So um, obviously it is something, but it's not something that I've ever um, looked at or come across. Uh, so um, yeah, sorry, can't help you there. How long did it take you to get your mindset comfortable with drawdown periods? Oh, yeah, good question, Kamal. Um, I think what, probably a more important one is, you know, how long did it take my my mindset to get used to just trading? And I would say about two and a half years. The first two and a half years, it took that long to get me used to um the ups and downs and trying to get on top of my discipline um, in that two and a half years is, uh, there. So I would say that was the case. But as far as getting comfortable with drawdown periods, it would have prob no doubt it would have taken longer than that because although you can get to a point where you're successful and profitable as a trader, but to get truly comfortable with drawdown periods takes years and years and years. Um, and it's constant work uh, in in uh, getting used to that uh, as an example i had my biggest drawdown uh ever in 2018 i was 20 years or more into my trade over 20 years into my trading at that point and then i just had my biggest ever drawdown <clears throat> now psychologically i'm at that point fine for it you know but it's still to someone who might only be five years into their trading that might be a real challenge, you know. So it it does take years and years of you know just working on your mindset to to get more comfortable with it. One of the best things that you have is experience. The more times you have a drawdown and then you trade out of the drawdown, it adds to that experience of okay, I've been here before. When the next drawdown comes, and then the next one, you've been there before, and uh, so yeah. Instead of the ATR being uh, to determine the stop loss, can the MACD be used to determine the stop loss in any way? Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't use an ATR anyway to determine stop losses, but that's fine to use, but I don't personally. But um, could you use the MACD to determine? Not that I know of. I've not really thought of that. I've never come across that. Uh, Nan, Nan, Nanla, um, sorry, I've probably not pronounced your name very well. So I've never come across it. So um, I don't think so, though. No, I would rather you, you base your stop loss based on the price itself, not on an indicator. Uh, how many instruments do you trade? Uh, the question, your next question, um, what's the best? When is the best time to enter a trade? Um, I've skipped that because there is no best single time to enter a trade. That's why I'm not not bothering to answer that because any time can be a reasonable time to enter a trade. It, it's, what's important is the setup, is what the setup you're using, 
not anything about the time. How many instruments do you trade? Uh, Tony, um, you've obviously come in a bit late. Um, uh, over 90% of the time I'm trading the euro dollar, Tony. Uh, so over 90% of the time. I do trade stock indices, S&P, NASDAQ, Dow at times. And I do trade other major currency pairs as well. Um, but no, 90% plus of my trading is um, euro dollar. Just personal choice. It's the biggest currency pair. And I'm quite happy trading it. I'm in positions a lot of the time uh, through the year. So, yeah. okay. I think we are about there. And I'm very conscious that it's now, we're an hour and a half into this webinar here tonight so if anyone's got any more questions by all means do quickly write them down i can carry on but um but otherwise um we're we're getting close to the end here um again um very thankful to uh tick mill for organizing the webinar here tonight and i'll be back to do another one i'm sure fairly soon um i've done a few for tick mail now over uh, through last year um, so by all means, if you want some more technical ones, I've done some previous technical ones with Tickmill in 2023. So do, if you are in touch with them, ask them for some of the other webinars I've done as well. Um, but otherwise, I will certainly be back um, at some point in the next uh, couple of months to do another one. Uh, but let's just see uh, do, if any other questions before we wrap this up properly. Do you think trading will be more regulated, more regulated in the UK? Yes, I do uh kamal yeah i do i think that not just in the uk i think in europe and australasia or australia and new zealand um so i think the trading in 10 years time will look will be different to what it is right now and so um across the board the regulators it will become more regulated why do i think that this is a uh, you know the, i could take spend a half an hour on that subject but the bottom line is we live in a world whereby governments don't want people going out gambling, uh, whether it, they're betting on the horses or races or sports or whatever. You know, it's allowed, but they try to regulate it. And it's the same with financial trading. What they don't want is loads of people out there. A, a government doesn't want its citizen, you know, too many of its citizens going out there and losing loads of money in, in sports betting or or financial trading even. So um there no I no have no doubt that they will impose more regulations. You'll still be out of trade, but there there'll be more regulations in the future um to uh to stop newer traders in ten years time. Whether a new trader will be able to, you know, if they're based in the UK or Europe in ten years time, whether they'll even be able to trade or not, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I'm just speculating there, but it wouldn't surprise me you know, that regulations to an extent get to some degree or another anyway, um, get tighter um, in 10 years time. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, for a beginner, which is better between an EMA and an SMA? Well, Lebo, I'm going to be biased and I'm going to say an SMA because that's what I use as I went through that. Do you think regulators will ban automated bots on MT4 and MT5 in the coming years or platform that allow AI trading? Um, maybe. Um, maybe on that one. Um, uh, will they ban automated bots? I don't know. Um, if it's something you've created yourself, I don't know. Um, th there would, uh, There's plenty. I guess there must be so many automated bots that just go and massively over trade and just blow people's accounts up. I think that's what you're probably referring to so yes i'm sure they'll want to uh come down on that sort of stuff as much as they can yes i'm sure but there's lots of automated bots that are good in it so as well so um but yes yeah, trying to uh reduce the leverage the exposure um then yes i'm sure they'll, they'll probably try and do that yeah that's something Is there any ECN broker you know? Um, well, just um, uh, use Tickmill. Um, Tickmill are, are still an ECN broker, are, are they not? So I'd say Tickmill. 
Uh, thank you for your time. Um, thank you. Um, have I missed anyone here? Strategic asset allocation or technical asset allocation? Oh, um, I don't know the answer to that one because I don't quite understand the question. So um, on that one. So sorry, I don't quite understand your question there. Bear in mind, I mean, you're talking about asset allocation. So you're now talking about port having a portfolio. I'm talking about trading here, trading financial instruments um, using the likes of uh, futures contracts or uh, CFDs, FX. So um, asset allocation per se isn't isn't important when it comes to those. Um, you know, using risk management is important. So if you've got ten thousand dollars in a trading account, you should only risk a very small percentage on any one given trade. So it's a bit different to asset allocation because that's when really we're talking about having a portfolio. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. I think we're about there. I've seen lots of thank yous. So that's really very kind of you. Thank you for coming along and spending your time with me the, here this evening. And hopefully it's given you some food for thought right from the beginning. And I know you so quickly will forget stuff. So do I do encourage you to get the recording they won't have the recording until probably tomorrow. Um, but I would encourage you to get the recording because there's bits in this that you may forget. <laughs> so, um, yes. Uh, but thank you so much for coming along tonight. And um, hopefully I'll see you again soon.